Yesterday, we presented a list of types of families we have in our churches. And a few of you came to me and reminded me of a few. And I, I made a list of, of four more. I'd like to see if I could remember them. One family we have a lot in our church is the spiritually single. That is the Adventist married to a non-Adventist. I call them spiritually single because they have a, long, a sense of aloneness, doing everything alone, come to church alone. And then we have the multi-remarriage families where someone has been married more than two times, divorced and remarried more than two times, three times, four times. And then we have the transsexual, transgender families. It's hard to accept that we have those. You may not know it. You not need to know it, because I don't have to tell you. But they're there. And I, I thought about those couples um, that are our family units that are with us. Today, multiple remarriage. Yeah, I said that. Multiple remarriage families. Okay. Um, there are three kinds of obedience, should I say. One, we use the same word for the other. And in, in, in talking about obedience, this is something that we greatly uh, misunderstand, I believe. And in my experience, not only as a pastor, but a father and a psychotherapist, I see that this is something that we need to clarify or unlearn, or understand better when it comes to obedience. There are three words on the screen. Could you say them with me? Obedience, conformity, and compliance. Obedience and conformity. Obedience is not something we are born with, and, it is, not, and it, is not, it is certainly not something that we can achieve under the law. It is a tool of survival that is learned in the valley of hard knocks. Parents often distort the meaning and idea and concept of obedience. Pastors often do that. Leaders of corporations and institutions often do that. Obedience is a requirement. If obedience is a requirement to do something simply because I told you to do it, then it's, it's distorted. It must be a natural outgrowth, an understanding of coming out of a relationship with someone. For the law made nothing perfect, and now a better hope has taken its place. And that is how we draw near to God. Remember the law is about obedience? Okay. The laws that we establish in our homes, isn't it about obedience? It is. So then how, how can we then draw near to our parents or, or draw near to God and have a better understanding of, of what this obedience is all about. Now let's look here about the three types of obedience, should I say. The first one on the screen is what? Conformity. Let me ask a question right up front. When you ask your three-year-old to turn off the television, what are you asking your child to do? Conform, comply, or to transform? Now, that last one is the concept we're going to be sharing today. The obedience, the concept of obedience. You want your child to conform, comply, or transform. You're right. Yes, you're right. A three-year-old must comply. Because you, you're telling the child to do it and not ask questions. Correct? Now, remember, Ellen White says quite clearly that... A child, a very young infant, will comply and should comply and must comply, but eventually compliance must mix with reasoning. So if you're asking your five-year-old to still comply, your, three, your ten-year-old to still comply, you're getting in trouble. By the time your child reaches 17 and is still complying, you're in big trouble. So, conformity, pressure to go along now. That's conformity. Yes, that's what happens how people join gangs. Okay? They feel pressured. They don't, no one pressuring them. They feel pressure from within to conform. 
to be accepted in the community in that in that in that uh, state. And you know the text where we will go back to be be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Look at that. All many of us didn't realize that it had anything to do with obedience, conformity, a kind of obedience, pressure from within to be accepted by those around you. But be transformed. What is that word? That's a process of understanding, a process of learning. By the renewing of your mind, intellectual transformation. So it has to be a process, not, come here, boy, let me get this in your head for the first time. Is that transformation? I can call it hit formation. <laughs> and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And then the other, the other word is compliance. What is the other type of obedience we talked about? What is that? This is doing something simply because someone told you to do it. Now, like we asked a three-year-old baby, would you kindly turn off the television? But let me give you the mistake we make as parents. The child is watching the television perhaps for one of the first times in his life, and you, or whether he's young or she's young, and you say, Susie, would you turn off the television, please? The little baby is a few rooms away from you. And you never, go, you never go there to check on it. Half an hour later, you didn't turn off the television yet? What mistake you made? You lost a great teaching moment. You go to the child. This is an infant knowing nothing about values and making decisions, not even the danger of the television. And you go to the child, and you stand beside the television, the child, and say, Susie, would you kindly turn off the TV. Now, you are asking the child to turn off the TV because you have authority to turn it off without question. So you can teach the child something. So you ask the child, would you kindly turn off the TV? And the child doesn't move. Five seconds pass, you turn it off. No question. This child doesn't understand things. You sit down beside the child and say, do you know why I'm asking you to turn off the TV? You don't have to tell the child right away. You want the child to think. You say, oh, I Think about it. Maybe next, when you get old, I'll tell you. I'll talk about it tomorrow. Process. Going in this child's mind. But you leave the child, you, you just tell the child, the child has a hill of angels, don't know what to do. Turn off TV, what's that, mommy? You know, nothing. And you don't help the child. You lose the opportunity of helping this child to transform. Transform meaning that they will accept the values you're teaching them as their own as they grow older and older. Are you with me? It's the same thing with uh, adults, you know. It's the same thing. So then, it's interesting. You have public compliance or conformity. We will do what we want when we're supposed to do or asked to do only when the group is there and not when we are alone. Some people have that. And then there is private compliance. So conformity. If the group influences us to convert or truly change, then we have private compliance. But it is usually a result of the group influence and not your personal decision or reasoning. Once again, what do you really want to do? What do you think we should do? Comply, conform, or transform? Isn't it interesting to note that uh, we know for sure conformity has no place, isn't that right? No one should conform, but we, we do it. Compliance has a little place, especially as we, as, we, as we bring up a child. You know, the child is running across the street. You tell the child, stop. <laughs> the child doesn't stop, it gets hit by the car. So the child has to comply. But as we are saying, eventually the child has to know why shouldn't he or she run across the street at 12 o'clock midday? Because giant cars pass and will hit you and kill you. That's why. So many would say, and we agree in the sense that obedience means submitting to the will of the authority of another. In our sense, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, who is that great authority? God. Isn't he asking us to submit to him? Yes, he is. But is he coercing us? Is he forcing us? What is he doing? He's loving us. 
He's wooing us. He's inviting us to come and be together with him. Now, interesting with the concept of, of obey. Obey. In, the, in Hebrew, the word obey is translated to hear. What is the word translated to? To hear. And uh, interestingly, that the, the word to hear, you know, so faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's the word obey. Now, when you hear the word hear, it suggests that obedience is not an act in itself. It's a, it's a what? It's a transition. It, it's, it's a transformation. It's a process, rather. So then if you, if, if you feel that one act, you take up your hand and you beat that child to do something, what have you done then? Is that a process of learning or is an act of forcing someone? Isn't this interesting? You know? So the word translate obey, is, it is 1,159 times in the Old Testament. And 785 times it is transferred here. How many times? Here in the Bible. Now think about that when we talk about obedience. That when God is saying, here, it means that, come, sit down. Let's reason. Let's talk about this. I want you to listen. I want you to develop a, a, a cognitive process guided by the Holy Spirit. So you can do because you want to do it. I must love Jesus because I want to. Not because I'm frightened of hellfire, which is, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm scared of hellfire too. <laughs> but what's the ultimate motive? Jesus. And look at it. Harten. Um, 169 times, obey only 81 times, okay? Publish 17 times, understand 9 times, ob obedient 8 times, diligent 8 times, sh show 6 times, sound 3 times, and so on, and declare 3 times, and so forth and so forth. Isn't this interesting? Here. Christ was obedient to God. Christians are called to be obedient of faith in Romans 5 and Romans 16 and Romans 16 to 26. But what is it referring to? It's referring to first establishing a relationship that will woo us, that will retract us, that will help us to understand and, and to become better in what we're doing. So biblical obedience in my, in my definition is transformation. What is that? I call that godly obedience. This obedience trap, you know what it is? When we, when we coerce someone, when we force someone to do something simply because we say, even on the job, even in the church, and when we have, when we have um, obedience because the pastor says it, we have toxic faith. Like the thrusts that is surging, ground swell in our churches with this legalism. Mark of the beast and Sabbath and you're going to hell if you eat meat. All you ladies wearing pants in here, you're going to hell. <laughs> All you women who are ordained elders, you better hurry, get, give up that certificate because you're going to burn in hellfire. By the way, are you kidding? I'm kidding. One, one Adventist brother has a station in the Bahamas, and he says those exact words on the radio station for the public to hear. And we're trying to tell him, we actually sent out letters and disclaimers this week in the public that that station has nothing to do with the Seventh-day Adventist church. But he's calling our names, trying to, 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 to purge us. I called him on the radio station in one show he had one morning. I had the gall and gumption to do it. I, I was burning up. And I asked the question, I said, my brother... What is the purpose of this station? Is it to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or is it to purge the Adventist church on the public radio station? And this, this surge is, is coming up. While I, I, I believe vegetarianism is the best thing in the world, I want all of you to be vegans like me. You're going to still go to hell if you don't have Jesus. 
And you can burn a long time too. <laughs> Are you with me? It's Jesus. The Adventist church suffered greatly in the 40s and 50s and 60s in North America and other parts of the world because of legalism. Morris Venden preached a sermon in 1985 at a general conference session on righteous by faith. He was fired for preaching that same sermon in 1954. Praise the Lord, we have come so far by faith. So how can we make our loving relations in our home, our, our families, our, our children, our children understand the true meaning of obedience? Do we, it's something you have to grit your teeth sometime when you, when you see your children falling away. Sometimes we have dreams for our children, you know, dreams that they would be such, I, you know, I never dreamt that my son would not marry a virgin. Why, why, why are you laughing? I had a dream he'll marry a virgin. No, you see, it's obvious because, see, you, you don't know what I'm talking about. My daughter-in-law is one of the best things in gingerbread cookies and sliced bread to my son. And she had a child before birth, before she was an, a Christian, period. That son, that child is our chosen grandson, Amen. as we call him, six years old. And then we have another child. Now, now, is she going to heaven first or, or you? Well, which one are you going to? <laughs> And some of you sitting before me, you, no one knows that you used to smoke marijuana 20 years ago. And the truth about it, some of you are sneaking right now, you know. <laughs> well, what's the famous um, um, English um, um, alcoholic beverage? In the Bahamas, it's Kalik and Heineken and things. Well, what is it in England? Huh? What is it? See, you all will pretend you don't know you know. Come on, talk it. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, Heineken? You don't drink? I don't drink either. But, uh, <laughs> but most, many of us drank before, and I've discovered sometimes people, they come to church tipsy. You know what I mean? You know? <laughs> oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, we forget where we have come from, and then we carry others so hard. Isn't that something? You used to wear them dresses way up here, the cheeks flapping underneath, you know? <laughs> and you see, the first girl come to church, she is the woman demon from hell. Well, you and hell too, you just remember that sometimes. Yeah. Grace that is greater than all my sins. So how, how can we teach this grace to our children? By thinking that obedience is not do it because I am daddy and mommy. Sit down here, sit, I, 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 I say sit. And the Bahamas, you know, bring your black self here. <laughs> your peasy head, you no good boy. Or your red self. They called me red when I was small. I used to hate it. My beard was red, you know. Thank God for the transformation of grace. <laughs> oh, boy. Are, are you with me this morning? So what is obedience? What is the... the what is the term I call for godly obedience? What is it? What is it? So someone tans your feet and let me feel good as a teacher. What did you understand? The, Papa, pardon me? Lo you said loyalty to your parents? That's good, but that doesn't strike it. Because I can have blind loyalty. I do it because uh, I, I, you know, I, uh, you know, I won't get some food you know, the next day for breakfast. They're paying the rent. Someone tell me, what does it mean of transformation? Pardon me? Change, yes, but there's an element in the change. Or elements, pardon me? By love, because of love, yes, but the key words are process. That it takes time. Okay, and how you do that? Voluntary response. You take time. By asking questions, Ma, Annie and I tried our best to make it a point that everything we ask our children to do, we ask them the question, do you know why mommy and daddy want you to do this? Every time. And we don't have to answer right away, you see, we parents, you see. 
But we have to ask the questions. And we want to think. We'll talk about it tomorrow. When you get older. Do you know why? Everything. We have chores. We have chores. Uh, make schedules for chores. Why do we have the schedule? Why are we asking you to wash the dishes? To troll? Why? Why? Don't just give them. Give them. Give them. Teach them. So they can transfer. When they get 95, they still can transfer to their great-grandchildren. So we always ask them the question. And, and when Mark Gerard, our son, who is now almost 30, was at, at, at Lincoln at uh, Union College, he was already, he went to college when he was 20, finished high school at 20. And, uh, and uh, I remember one year I called him, we're not married, I think he was 21 or 22, and uh, called him very regularly. We had a close relationship, still do. And um, I said, how are you doing, Gerard? He, he said, fine, daddy. And the conversation went on. I said, how are you handling your sexual desires? <laughs> he said, daddy, I okay, I, I okay. <laughs> 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 now, honestly, I was not expecting him to tell me an answer. He's an adult now. But I was trying to rekindle, spark in his mind. I'm holding him accountable to some principles I gave him. So I asked the question. How are you handling your sexual desires? A big man, man to man, but daddy to son. And that sometimes as we grow, as the children grow, we have to ask the question, why am I asking you to come in at 12 o'clock? Why there is no curfew in this house? Because a curfew is in the heart. Are you with me? We didn't have curfew for a long time, and eventually, obviously, it came up automatically. Because if curfew, this is godly obedience, this is transformation. If curfew is a specific time to come home and that's it, you are in big trouble. Curfew is a principle of life. So if curfew is 11 o'clock and that's all your children know, so when they go to the party that you take them to, that you've called and checked on, that's everything okay, and you dropped them there, you went to the door and you shook the hand and say, how are you doing, miss? I want to thank you very much. You know those kind of stuff? That's what you do? Okay. And then you... The party ends at 9, at 10 o'clock, but the curfew is at 11. A, a good child will call home and say, uh, Daddy, um, the party is over. C can I uh, stay another hour? Yes, son, you can stay even an hour and a half. Wonderful, wonderful. But what, are the, what will another child will do if curfew is the time? Wouldn't tell you. Gets in a car and go all the way to London. Have fun. Get home by 11. Lying to you. If the child understands that obedience, what obedience is all about. If you try to inculcate in that person's mind through questioning, through probing, through teaching, to understand the process of learning so the child can transmit what he or she knows to someone else. Because I'm my biggest pet peeve in the Bahamas and the West Indies where I go, I discovered is here too, and this is the third time I've been here, is that many parents of yesteryear didn't teach so their children can transfer to their children, what they've learned. Oh, they were successful because 40, 50, 100 years ago, when mommy said, sit, sit, where are you going? No place to go, but where are you going? No iPad, no iPhone, no Android, uh, no theater, no, uh, no cars to go. Where are you going? You gotta stay. Now there is attraction everywhere. Even from the living room to the, to the, to the bedroom, lock the door. Behind there, all kinds of things going on. You want to teach your child good obedience, make sure no computer, no phone, and no iPad, no PS2, PS79 in their room. <laughs> and make sure when you go to bed at night, you have the cordless phone. It's amazing, you know, your child, your child has uh, been talking all day for five hours to her friend. And then they get home, pick up the phone, talking to the five hours. Isn't that sickening? <laughs> It's a wonderful thing for telephone bonding. It's, it's today's world. We have to respect some of that, but that's a little too much. So how, how do you teach your child? How do you talk to your child? How, how do you help your child? You have to be able to know some points. Let me see if I can reach those points about, uh, about, under, about empowerment, about um, what you call it, about um, obedience. That is very, very important. That some principles that will help us to know. Because obedience has three components. <clears throat> I don't know if it's the next one on the screen, but I, I will. Um, obedience has three components. The first component is understandable. What is that? 
Obedience is understandable. Come, let us reason together, said the Lord God. Now remember that. Obedience is understandable. So when you tell someone, your child or an adult, what to do, how you're saying it, what you are saying is easy to understand, not complicated. Are you with me? Okay. So many times we give information and it's not understandable. It's very confusing. Our rules are to be simple. Our rules are to be clear. Our rules are to be understandable. So even for God, when He tells us something, obedience is understandable and it's reasoning. Now, you're not reasoning with the little infant, in, two, in a sense. You're not reasoning with, but it's reasonable. Are you with me? So now, if we, if we do not understand that, then we have a problem of lack of understanding. So let me see if I could reach... The, oh, no, that's not it. Okay. The last ca- component of obedience, as we said already, is... Imp- the second component is empowerment. What is it? When Jesus tells you to do something, He gives you the power to do it. So then, as a parent, if you're telling your child to do something, you're empowering your child through the language, through the kind words, not, not to, to the forced language. You, you're encouraging your child how to do it. You're empowering the way you... And, and, and you, you, you affirm the child by the way you're saying it. You, in, you, you, you are, are, are honoring the child's intelligence, not making the child feel like a stupid person. So what's the first component of obedience, of godly obedience? What is it? It's understandable. So I ask a question to yourself. Are you understandable to your child? I don't care how young it is. The child could be an infant. And remember you, let me share something here as I just divert a little bit. From birth, your child must learn obedience from the minute it comes out the womb. So a child sleeps 23 hours or almost endless sleep when it's first born. Where is the child sleeping? Between you as husband and wife in the bed, which is not sinful, is not wrong, it might be logistically necessary. Or in his or, her, or his or her own crib, in her own room. I think it's wonderful when parents learn, hey, from birth, my child, if it's logistically possible, sleeps in his or her own room, and the child has a bedtime from birth. Yeah. Our children went to sleep 6 o'clock for about 5 or 6 years, and then 7 o'clock till they reached up in the teens, unless they were late assignments, church work, um, school work. Seven o'clock! Nine o'clock is late. Parents, remember, this stuff about we need eight hours of sleep is for old people, (laughs) adults, children, toddlers, 10, 11, 12, need 15 hours of sleep a day. Little ones, one, two, and three, need 18 hours of sleep a day. Where to get it from? They sleep during the day, naps. Adults need eight hours, and the older they get, less and less and less, you know, until they don't sleep at all. They, they're gone. <laughs> well, theoretically speaking. Do you know what the latest research is? That teenagers thrive best on 9.2 hours. No, no, erase that. Let me say it differently. The minimum amount of sleep they discovered will help teenagers to thrive is 9.2 hours, but they should have 10 to 12 hours of sleep. So your teenager needs 9.2 hours of sleep. How do we get that? They go to bed at what time? Nine and wake up. Seven, that's how many? 10 hours? So what did they do up late at night? And then how are you teaching them? You, your three-year-old, uh, Robert, could you go to bed, please? Uh, and you're watching TV. Uh, why go to bed? Go, why? go to bed. <laughs> You're already making a mistake. You're supposed to take your child to bed. He's a little child. She's a little, take your child to bed. Have the ritual of closing down, praying, whatever. 
your ritual of, of, of ending the day, and then you close the door of the child, and you go and do what you want to do. But heaven's sake, you don't leave the door open and the TV blasting right over there, and, you, and you're punishing your child for watching TV. You close the door. You have your rituals, and, leave, and, then, and then if... When the child falls asleep, you, you want to open the door, you open the door all night, and you can have freedom to see what's happening to the child. But set an example in the home. Don't tell your child just what to do. Making noise and keeping the child up. By the time the child reaches 18, 19, or 20, hopefully the child would have adopted principles. Remember, this is a challenging world. Very, very challenging world. They, they attracted so many bright lights, so many fiery darts from the evil one that's coming. How could the principles today fit the principles next 20 years or next 40 years if the law doesn't come? Because you would have given them godly principles. Your, your methods of reasoning and understanding would be different. Why do we keep the Sabbath? Do you know why? I'm not asking you a theological question this morning. I want you to think and reason. Why do we not eat pork? Is it only because Jesus said don't do it? Well, why did he tell you not to do it? Could what we believe transcend time and culture? What about our children? What do we want them to believe? So we want our children to transform. What do you want them to do? It's a process of learning, a process of understanding. And there are three components of, trans of godly obedience, which is transformation. And we use the word within this. What are the three components? Understandable, empowerment, and transformation. Don't ever forget that. The last a few minutes. How many minutes do I have? 8.3 minutes. Okay. <laughs> I want to give to you the Pepsi Foundation. Now, this is a good formula. Anyone here ever drank Pepsi? Don't raise your hand. You see, y'all don't want to tell the truth. So, okay. Okay. Well, this is an, is an acronym, Pepsi. You remember the Bible's, we say, pray, the Bible says pray without ceasing. You remember that? Yeah. Now, if you really pray without ceasing, you'll die of hunger. You know that, right? You don't know that? You stay on your knees and pray all day for the next 48 hours or 48 years. You be like Gaya Tuma, Buddha, who becomes only skin and flesh. You'll die. So what does it mean? So years ago, I, I thought about that. I said, this is not really what God wants us to do. Or this is not the meaning of prayer without ceasing. There has to be other components. So I developed the Pepsi, the acronym, the Pepsi Foundation. And they are the words. The family that prays together. The family that eats together. The family that plays together. The family that sleeps together. And then I had to find another word for the I, for the Pepsi. And I used the word intends together. The family has to intentionally, deliberately do all these things to have a healthy family. The family that prays together, it's all about worship. What we do in a home every day, every morning, every evening. An atmosphere of prayer, of worship, of honoring God. That's important. Every day. And then in a family they, where there are children, there are three, three kinds of worship periods or devotions. Two is option. One is optional and the rest are compulsory. First is the individual one. When I get up in the morning... I roll over the bed, my wife is in bed, I kneel down and pray. And then I might go in my study for a few moments, depending on the logis logistics at that time, and open the Bible, meditation, or I might do it a few minutes later. That's my personal. It has nothing to do with my wife and I. And no children at home, it's just my wife and I. And he can I. Then we have our couple devotion. Or if children are there, we have our family devotion. A set time earlier, maybe 7 o'clock before we go to whatever. It's set time. Then if you have children... It's often good or necessary to have a couple time. Maybe there's a crisis. You and your wife want to pray about something that children may not know about, or you have a personal couple problem. That's the third one that is maybe as necessary. Okay? But at least two of them. If you're single, 
How many of you would you have? One. If you're single with children, how many would you have? Two. Every day. And then we always gave an opportunity as the children were going. There was one day or two days we didn't have family devotion. Uh-uh. What days were that? Usually Sabbath morning. And sometimes on Sunday, we, want, we tell the children, this is your time. See, from the time they're home before they go to college, to New Bowl, they need time for themselves to have their own devotions. That's how you teach them, under your supervision. The family that prays together. The, fa the family that eats together, stays together, grows together. This is one of the most important ingredients as all the others for family development. Eating together meaning you're eating in the same area, not necessarily around the dining room table. It could be under the sapodilly tree or those big trees you have in London or in Somerset. It could be in front of the TV watching 3ABN or, or, or the TV off, whatever, on the coffee table or the postum table. <coughs> you, you, you're together. But I tell you this. Write this down. <clears throat> Every healthy couple, family, should eat together at least three times a week. I say that because logistically speaking, daddy may be going to work at 5 a.m. or whatever. There's, maybe you may not be able to work out every morning, but you have to set a time. If we don't set a time that we're all going to eat together, thank God for Sabbath, because some of us will not eat together if it's not for Sabbath. Thank God for Sabbath. But other than Sabbath, we need, we need a total of three a week, ideally every day. But if not possible, we need to make sure we set a time that we eat together. When I say eat together, you know, not that mommy is over there in the way corner watching her movie and daddy over here playing his dummy nose. And they're in the same room. That's not together, brother. Together is where we interact. Are you with me? Eye to eye. And here is the secret when it comes to little children. You invite the children around the dining room table. You invite the children around the dining room table. Say, come, let's eat together. And then the adults start an adult conversation. And the children chime in. But daddy, shut up. <laughs> when you see adults talking, do not say a word. That's a very bad old-fashioned teaching. You invited the children around the table, include them in the conversation. Now, when it reaches where you need the adults to talk, then you say, now, children, I'd like you to go. You're finished eating. Go over there, mom and dad. The adults want to talk something about something. Do that. But don't invite them and insult them, their intelligence. You're, you're teaching them. You're, you're helping them not to be uh, intellectually astute, respectful, and honoring. They're there. Let the conversation include them. So there's a family, family that plays together, eats together, and the family that... As prays together, eats together, and the family that plays together. Oh, for heaven's sake, many Adventist families don't even know what that is to, to play together. What? You drop your children off the social society now, you don't even go with them. Don't know what it is. And all you hear is the bad things, and you join the cuss, criticizing the people who criticize them, and you are not even there. Then what do you do at home? Do we have fun time? Laugh together. Oh, one of the greatest things is when mom and dad and, and children just laugh together, arm wrestle, play, have fun, you know. In fact, one of the greatest things to parents to help you is to realize, remember that you were once stupid and you were once a child. You wanted to climb the, the tree 2 o'clock in the morning, but your mom prevented you. You wanted to do it. You wanted to do some crazy things. I used to wear orange pants and white shirt to socials, you know. <laughs> I had these jeans, these jeans, these colorful jeans they used to sell in the store and the big belts, you know. You think my parents say, take that off, boy? <laughs> no, you know, you know. It's, we, we must remember we were once children. Have fun with your children. Make an opportunity, a time. Set a time to have fun with your children. You cannot be too busy. You will regret it. Take them to social. Go to socials with them. If you, you don't have to participate necessarily because you're too old and decrepit and backbone, but go there, have fun, laugh with them, watch a healthy, healthy vegetarian movie with them. A little comedy once in a while. Have fun. Play dummy nose. You know, arm wrestle. Some of us are so straight laced and hard, man. And not even a smile on our face. You're going to lose heaven because of that, you know. Family that prays, 
eats, plays, and sleeps together, grows, understands, and learns together. When I say sleep together, I don't mean the same bed. I mean in the same house. No one sleeps at Grammy's house every night. If your family doesn't need that. We sleep in the same home. And the thing about it, home is so attractive that no one wants to sneak out. They are there. Daddy and mommy sleeping in the same bed. Daddy and mommy, they're married by the way, sleeping in the same bed. And it's not a king size bed, it keeps you apart. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> the king size bed. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a king size bed, but the truth about it, some people want a king size bed because they want to keep apart. Yeah. <laughs> I like a queen size bed, a little closer. But my brother in law, he was so big, he needed a king size bed, you know. <laughs> but but you, you sleep in the same bed. And not only that, when you go to bed every night, moms and dads who are married, you are hugging each other. You're holding each other. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sister. Hallelujah. You, you're hugging each other. You, you're embracing each other. You're holding. That's a very good mess. And then, you know, by the time you sleep, you're all over the place, you know. <laughs> you know that's, that's okay. That's okay. And children are in their own bedrooms. No little children sleeping between you. Remove them, please. That's another seminar I have. Maybe I'll talk about it the next time. Move that one between you. you know. I'm talking about the, they sleep in, they can't hear. <laughs> huh? one, one, one little uh, baby was in her own crib, one year old. One year old in her own crib in the bedroom with mom and dad, and mom and dad were going down to Jerusalem. They were really, <laughs> they were really cutting the mustard. They were having a good time. And they were certain that the little one year old would sleep. The little one year old got up and said, Daddy, stop hurting mommy. <laughs> Constant. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. Oh, boy. Take the children out of the bedroom. They can sleep at any time. And when you put, when you put the child in bed tonight, if tomorrow night when you're going to try this for the first time in their own bedroom, the child is three years old, you don't say, you are the parent. Remember, you are the parent, so you don't ask the child, uh, you think you want to sleep by yourself? You made the first mistake. Uh, you think you can be scared? The child, whoa, 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 what is that all about, scared? <laughs> Afraid? What, what, what was that? No, you don't put these in. It's like, some, like you're introducing the first of food to your child for the first time, and, and the child never tastes to the food, and, and you say, you think you like this? You want, you want to eat this? <laughs> what do we say? Just give it to the child. You know, and then the, we do some stupid things. We're going to taste it first. Mmm, this thing's bad. You want some? <laughs> well, you know, we, 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 we do some things that are stupid, you know? Your child, they don't have any taste buds like that. Just give it to them. You know, we used to blend the broccoli and nothing in it. No salt, no sugar, no milk. Just and give it to them, you know. Thank you, Daddy. Hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? It's interesting, isn't it? So family that eats together. What? Play, prays together? No. Family that prays together, eats together, plays together, sleeps together, not in the same bedroom, on the same bed, only with his mom and dad, but in the same house. And the environment wants them to stay there, not sneak out at night. And the last one, the family that intends together. We intentionally, there, is, there are rituals, there are traditions, there are practices, there are philosophies, there are uh, uh, conditions in this home. We, we intentionally make an effort. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. John, who said that? I want to shock you a bit. This is my view. You don't have to say it's lords and needs of the Persians. When we read that text, we think Joshua just went out and said, Hey, I want to let you know, I'm telling my family members that we're going to serve the Lord. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Joshua and his children and wife were already together in order to stand. Joshua was only the vocal, the voice. He was not instructing fathers. See, some of us think 
the dad is the spiritual lead in the home, you see. So I'm going to speak for you all tonight. I want you to listen. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You understand that? You understand that? And your chest getting bigger and bigger. So much that you can't even hold the button like that. You know what I mean? You know, I know I'm going to shock you a bit here, but I'd like to tell you, my, this is Barrington Brennan's view. I am a spiritual leader in my home. What was the operative word before spiritual leader? I am a spiritual leader in my home. I am not the spiritual leader. My wife is also an intelligent woman. She is not my child. Standing on her own two feet, she is a spiritual. Imagine, imagine, it's only Anik and I now. You know, I, 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 we only us two this so Imagine, I'm in charge of my wife. She's an intelligent woman. She's no slave. We are spiritual leaders. So what are the Pepsi Foundation? What are the four letters? Pray. No, no, let's go together. Pray, eat, play, sleep, and intend. One of the me medical models of psychotherapy of a family, it's, it is the counter-instinctive, deliberate, intentional behavior. Counter-instinctively, meaning instinctively we move away from the pain. But we have to do counter-instinctive behavior. We move towards the pain. We make deliberate intention to do this thing. Tomorrow, be on time. And I pray my, my computer will not cor get corrupted with viruses and bacteria and all those stuff. I'm going to talk about the marriage. Kisses and hugs. It's going to be hot and spicy. <laughs> it's going to be provocative. Heart changing, stimulating, interesting. If you're married, come. Want to get married? Come. Don't know if you're married? Come. Troubled? Come. Never married? Come. If you don't want to get married, come. You're single, you're 95, just as long as you're not five. <laughs> come. This is adults. Be at 9.30. Won't you stand as we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we're so happy to talk to you this morning. As we know you're listening. As human beings, sometimes we, we try to do our own thing and we mess up. Sometimes the thing that we are doing is not of you. We're doing these seminars, so the things that we are doing is truly of you. I pray for everyone here, that single mom, that divorced widow, who not only was divorced, but now her divorced partner has been deceased. That married couple who is tormenting with issues, that grandmother who is pressured with taking care of the grandchildren. All of us here today, we need you as our Savior. Heal our wounded souls and may through this time together something different will happen to us. We leave this place baptized by your Holy Spirit. And our families different. The single ones, the married ones, the troubled ones, the happy ones, the confused ones. We are all becoming happy in Jesus. And then, Lord, we're not condemning anyone anymore and being judgmental. But we are serving you in a loving way. Send us away. Bring us back tomorrow at 930. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Son. In the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen.